Hi everyone. Um, so I'm hoping this is going to be the beginning of a, of a series, actually, of podcasts. And there's a lot of um, people out there, really fascinating people that I've some I've been in touch with, some not, and I think I have such a, such interesting things to say. And I'd like to explore a lot of the big questions about life, meaning, purpose, God politics, science, religion, with, with a lot of leading thinkers. Um, so I hope you'll enjoy the journey. We're going to have the privilege of talking today to Professor John Lennox, who is somebody I came across actually in a lot of my own um, uh, exploration and wrestling with, with big topics. Somebody who's, who's a professor of um, mathematics and also philosophy of science, and uh, yet is, an, is a believer in God and uh, people find that surprising, but um, he's actually a very big voice today. He's famous for debating many atheists and also writing an enormous amount of books, both about mathematics, philosophy of science, but also about this question of religion and science. So I'm quite excited that he's uh, given us some time and uh, looking forward to speaking to him today. Hi, welcome everybody. Um, today we have the privilege of having uh, John Lennox with us, who's a professor emeritus of mathematics at Oxford a renowned speaker and author of several books on the interface of science, philosophy, and religion. I think also holds a PhD in Oxford and Cambridge. That probably was controversial somewhere, no? <laughs> oh, not controversial at all. <laughs> because I got one at Cambridge, they give me one free at Oxford. So that's all <laughs> deceptive. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Let me ask you, Daniel, what did sure. you study? Philosophy. And then I did an MPhil in philosophy of mathematics. Where? Uh, so both in London, UCL. I was actually born UCL. in UCL. Yeah, yeah. And you did philosophy and mathematics. Wonderful. So our topic today, I wanted to explore a number of issues, but especially um, science and religion. That's obviously a big one. And uh, I remember when I was studying university, both undergraduate and uh, an MPhil, that it's, it's, there seems to be this sort of prevailing attitude in wider society, but I think especially in academia, that's almost like um, embarrassing to, to be a believer in God or, or to think that um, belief in God could be rational or that, uh, you know, science seems to be this competition that's usurped God and, and thrown it out. And I remember coming across your writings and, and being very impressed and really finding figures out there who have the contrary view, which I suspect is probably a bit of a minority view and not, not always an easy one to hold. Um, so I'd love to, to, you know, what was it that sort of got you to start writing? You've written a lot of books on many topics. What was it that, um, took you there? What was it that got you on that journey and, and, and wanted you to become a, a very vocal voice in this area? It was a long journey. I don't, I haven't talked about this much, but it's that I'm a German speaker. And during the Cold War, I spent a lot of time behind the Iron Curtain. That's the first thing. Wow. And was able to see how atheism worked itself out in <clears throat> the living in East Germany, and that taught me a lot. But then when the wall fell, I'd been translating Russian for to earn a bit of extra cash for a long time. So I went to Siberia oh, wow. on a two-way ticket. And in Siberia and elsewhere, many visits to Russia, because I could lecture in Russian in the end, and that opened every door. They're very generous to people who make many mistakes in their language. That was an opportunity to see atheism really operating. And it will interest you uh, as a rabbi that I met many Jewish friends and made friends in Russia and after coming out of Russia and to discuss with them the impact of atheism. That was a very interesting thing indeed. And all of it, unknown to me, was a preparation to meet the Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens of this world. Does right. that make sense to you? Yeah, I, I, I get that. That's uh, wow. Um, so I, I wanted to, a lot of things I want to actually ask, but, but um, maybe I'll ask this one as well, which is did, in that journey, did you have times of doubt? Um, did you have uh, self-questioning about it? There is where you thought, you, I, I know, for example, myself, that I remember my late teenage years, um, I had a lot of doubt uh, about and it, that, that put me on an exploration uh, myself. So I just wonder if that's something, uh, sounds like you went on almost a smooth journey from... Uh, oh, well, there are different kinds of doubt. And often when the word doubt is used, people immediately think of Winston Churchill and his black dog, you know, that sinking <laughs> feeling that everything is disappearing. I, I don't know that very much. But in the sense where doubt involves dubitare in Latin, uh, to be in two minds, really, double, 
dubitare. I have spent my life making my personal attitudes and beliefs vulnerable to questioning. And it's a bit like Descartes, I suppose, in it's systematic doubt, but queried by other people. And the result of that being prepared to be open, and it was very simple piece of argument lay behind it, that I really was interested in truth from an early age. Mm. And I could say that various people found their religions helpful, but that wasn't good enough for me. I was interested in what is true or not. If it's true, it is likely to be helpful. But <laughs> being helpful doesn't necessarily mean it's Maybe. true. Yeah. And so I did a lot of wide reading on, on the question of truth. And because I was questioning myself, I felt I can be questioned by others, no holds barred. And I've been doing that for woof, for over 50 years. Wow. And uh, 60 years, actually, it would be better to say, because I'm now in my mid-70s, which is why I'm locked down as a vulnerable coronavirus uh, person. And that kind of doubt, absolutely. And therefore, I, I feel that on many topics, though not all, I can get alongside and I can understand what people are thinking and feeling mm. about some of the great issues that, can lead to the other kind of doubt. Uh, that is when people experience personal tragedy or in the case of many of my Jewish friends are have been hit by the Holocaust or something awful like that. That raises very deep questions and can easily cast a, a deep cloud over people's thinking. So I've simply tried to be honest right. with myself and other people without necessarily always succeeding, of course. <laughs> wow. Um uh, but I wanted to, I mean, for example, this is just something, I don't know if you ever experienced um, mockery of your views, people yes. who were very hostile. I, I, and it's very funny because I, I, I always found people very nice in academia. It was almost like disdain, disdaining of a, but like in a very sweet way, but just almost sympathetic. Like they can't really believe in God, you know, I don't know if you experienced that. Oh, sure. sure. I've experienced that, but I've experienced the other very strong antagonism. And one yeah. huge lesson I learned in my early days at college, I, and I recorded in one of my recent books, Can Science Explain Everything, is that I found myself beside a Nobel Prize winner one night and decided to have a go at chatting and find out about his discoveries and so on. And risked asking the God question if his discoveries had ever led him to think that possibly there might be a God. Well, that was the wrong question to <laughs> ask. Yeah. And the conversation died instantly. But after the meal, he invited me and a number of senior people. I was 19, so I was an undergraduate, to his room. And they sat me on a chair, so far as I can recall. And he said, now, look, do you want a career in science? And I said, sure. Well, he said, then what you need to do is tonight to give up your naive faith in God in front of witnesses. Oh, wow. Wow. Now, you imagine that. If it had been wow. the opposite way around, and I'd been an atheist and he'd been a religious figure, he'd have lost his job the next day. Yeah, It wow. was talk about pressure. <laughs> so wow. in the end, I looked at it and I said, tell me what you've got to offer me that's better than what I've already got. And he came out with the philosophy of Emile Bergson. And fortunately, because I was a C.S. Lewis addict, I knew about Bergson. And I just smiled and said, if that's all you've got, I'll take the risk. And I got <laughs> up and walked out. <clears throat> that had a deep influence on me. Wow. It's sad. That sounds like a crazy experience. Wow. I, I wasn't thinking that something would be that extreme. Gosh, it I guess I've got to read the whole of your book. I can't just skim because <laughs> that's uh, obviously a very important episode. Um, wow. Um, but I, I think in general, what, what's what very interesting is why this is the like such such a such a widespread view that kind of yeah you have to let go of religion to embrace science they're incompatible. What well, it's it's based on deep misunderstandings, not only of religion, and by religion, I, I think if we keep to Judaism and Christianity, the the, the biblical base, but of science itself. And 
I found again and again, even people as eminent as Stephen Hawking, whom I vaguely remember at Cambridge, this idea that you have to choose between God and science because they're both offering explanation. But a few minutes thought will show you that they're different kinds of explanation. And the God explanation, I often say to people, no more competes with science than the Henry Ford explanation competes with engineering as the, as the explanation for a motor car. Mm. <laughs> They're totally different kinds of explanation in that sense. And therefore, to pitch them against each other on the basis, of course, of false readings of history, Galileo and the Roman Catholic Church Huxley and Wilberforce, the very first words, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's talking about the same universe that cosmologists study. So there is an intersection. Of course, uh, the biblical record, Genesis, Bereshit, is not a textbook of science. That's clear. But it does give us insights, and they're profoundly important insights into the nature of God's interaction of the universe. What strikes me like this is at some point in history, this narrative entered. At some point, yes, it did. You know, I don't know if it's in the Enlightenment or somewhere else, there's kind of this, uh, this and almost this rewriting of history because the early, I mean, the fathers of modern science were, were not just, um, to my understanding, at least not just a monotheist, but actually part of what motivated them to wrestle against the Greek conception of everything was this search for deeper unity. Um, so oh, if you look at the works of Newton, Francis ba Fra I always say to people, you know, everyone thinks that everyone, it was a battle against, against uh, religion. Francis Bacon has almost not a page about the permission to, to argue with the church. It's all about why the Greeks haven't given us a good enough model yet. There's got to be deeper unity. Oh, that's correct. A very memorable expression, actually. Men became scientific because they expected law in uh, nature. They expected law in nature because they believed in a legislator. In other words, that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That idea that there's a rational intelligence behind the universe was fundamental to the rise of modern science, as was also but slightly more subtly, the idea of contingency. God could have made it any way he liked. So if you want to discover it, you have to go and look rather than the kind of Aristotelian method of deciding what perfection is and then imposing that upon nature. So saying, well, the stars and planets appear to move. Um, they must move in circles because circles are perfect. And it was only when Kepler reacted against that. In addition, the Greek worldview had to be de-deified before science could advance because you had all these, what we now call gods of the gaps. I can't explain lightning, so I will postulate a god behind it. That all had to go. But the idea of a single god, um, as in... Uh, the Bible, that's a different matter altogether, and even some of the Greeks believed that. And so you get coming up through history, you mentioned the Enlightenment, which is very important. You got, there are so many strings in this, it's, it's very complex to me, because you had Newton with his clockwork universe, and some people argue that was the first uh, step really away from God, because there was the clockwork running. It seemed to be able to run on its own. So God was banished and uh, reduced in status to a kind of deism. But then in the 19th century, you had a lot of people like Wilberforce, for example, who were clerics and amateur scientists, some of them very bright. And you had Huxley, on the other hand, who was determined to rid science of these amateur clerics and so on and make it professional. He was the one who thought he would close all the churches and dedicate them as buildings to the goddess of wisdom, Sophia, and all that kind of stuff. So you had a very complex reaction in the Enlightenment, particularly in France, 
to the abuse of power, which was quite evident in the Roman Catholic Church. And people felt, well, we don't want any of that. So the baby got thrown out with the bathwater. Uh, and so you had a violent reaction to the idea of God. And God didn't seem to be necessary to do science. And science was king. And so <laughs> we land up where we are today with the likes of Richard Dawkins and so on. But a lot of it rests on profound misunderstanding, I think. Yeah. I mean, there probably is some, I mean, it's true nowadays you don't need God to do science. I mean, well, probably, probably it was never necessary, but it was a motivator. What I understand is it was, a, it was generally speaking, we probably don't recognize the extent to which would we have stumbled across the methods and would we have pushed as hard as we had and would we be where we are today if there hadn't been this widespread view in the deeper underlying order? I think we can test that. And the interesting thing is Dawkins actually threw this at me. I think it was in one of our public debates. I said, um, I, I was saying that <clears throat> in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth that idea existed for thousands of years, but it was only in the 1960s that science caught up with it because Aristotle had taught there was an eternal universe, there was no beginning. And Dawkins poo-pooed this and um, said, well, there's only a, uh, there's a choice between two things, either there was a beginning or there wasn't, so no big deal. And I said it was a big deal because the idea that there was a beginning, only one through in the end on the basis of massive evidence. Why? Because people didn't want the Bible to be true. The second one is the fact that I talked about the connection between biblical belief in a rational God and the rise of science. And he said, but look, everybody believed in God in those days. And I right. said, Richard, you're wrong. You've forgotten a large part of the world. The Chinese did not. Now, the interesting thing about the Chinese is they did develop technology. They never developed abstract science. And one of the people that knew about Chinese technology more than anybody else, because he wrote the definitive history of Chinese technology, was Joseph Needham, who was a chemist and a bit of a polymath. He spoke and wrote Chinese and all the rest of it. What's interesting about him is he was a neo-Marxist. And for years, he tried to understand from neo-Marxist principles why the Chinese had never got to abstract science. But he gave up in the end and admitted it. It's very interesting reading. And what he says, roughly speaking, is this, that the only difference that he could see between the West and the East on this issue was the Chinese lacked the unifying principle of a God that had made the universe and made it to run on certain laws that we could detect. Now, that seems to me to really answer your question to a certain extent, mm -hmm. that with the biblical background, belief in a rational God who created and upholds the universe, and lack of that belief was the difference between modern science or not. Now, we've left that behind in large part. And you said, oh, we can do science without God. Well, most people do. Um, but atheists do just as good science as uh, believers in God do. But that's not quite the point, because a large part of the scientific endeavor is not asking ultimate questions, philosophical questions, religious questions. And if I'm in the laboratory trying to decide about how the muscle in a frog's leg works and is connected to its brain, I don't have to consult Leviticus or anything else or bring my belief in God into it. But if at one step back I ask the question as a scientist, how is it that science works? How is it that mathematics enables us to understand the workings of the universe to a certain extent? Then that raises the deeper question of the existence of transcendence. So in direct practice, very few scientific questions lead directly to philosophical questions. Right.
And I actually wanted to come on to the question about uh, what you consider to be the most um, compelling argument for the existence of God, um, because many people today would say uh, that that um, the, the kind of there can either be non-overlapping magisteria or or a person can have faith, you know, um, have faith in the sense of faith in the sense of being irrational, or sometimes people see it as irrational, but that a rational person wouldn't come to the conclusion of um, of God's existence. And my own experience in life, although I did have um, a religious home I came to, was was one of doubt. And I remember it was actually a certain point in thinking and reading when I actually started to conclude that an infinite past was was likely to be an impossibility. That, that well, started, that's good. That's the Kalam argument. It is actually, and it's interesting, in Jewish sources in history, that's the main argument that's used, that there were opponents of the Kalam in Jewish uh, philosophy, Maimonides amongst them, although he had a different, uh, he said, yes, if, but but Aristotle they were, was back they were onto a good thing there. You see. I think so. And, and I certainly remember when, when that hit me, it was like, oh my goodness, well, if there can't be an infinite past, it doesn't matter how many multiverse or universe or anything there is before us. Correct. Ours, at some point there's a beginning. And that, so I remember when I was when I was at university, and people were saying, "So, how do you reconcile your faith with belief?" And I was well, actually, I've been the other way around. You know, I remember saying to an atheist friend once, "Which type of atheist are you? Are you a something from nothing, a store an infinite past?" They, they looked at me, they're like, "What do you mean?" I said, "Well, those are the only two alternatives, right?" I said, "Well, if they're both irrational, then that's there's only a third alternative, really." Um, but I was wondering what you consider to be the most uh, most significant. Well, important. I- I'm with you 100% there. I think that, first of all, the argument from history that I just made, because people can understand that, that it is the fact that there appears to be an intimate connection that most historians recognize, although they give you slightly nuanced opinions of how strong or how weak it is. There's that connection. Secondly, I would move into the philosophy and methodology of science, the very fact we can do science. And Einstein, you see, was clever, as you know, and he was bright enough to see that mathematical describability of the universe raised a real problem. And he famously said, the only incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it's comprehensible. Now, I think he was dead right there. Einstein was very bright. It's very interesting, actually, reading Max Yammer's book on Einstein's religion. Max Yammer, by the way, uh, have you come across him? He was yeah. a professor at bar Ilan, where I, incidentally, have been a visiting professor. But that's another fascinating story. We've got, we got to have more of this. you got so many amazing stories. <laughs> yes, well, anyway... Um, the uh, incomprehensibility of the fact that it's comprehensible, I think we need to think seriously about. And I often say to people, look, one of the major evidences for me that there is a God is just the fact we can do science. Because think about what is involved. Here's somebody thinking about the universe and they come up with a mathematical equation in their heads and lo and behold the two seem to go together. Now the most rational explanation of that is that ultimately the universe out there, my mind in here, are traceable to the same ultimate origin in an intelligent God. Compare that with my atheist friends and I often do this. I I say what do you do science with? And they say, well, I do it with my, and they're about to say mind when they realize it's not politically correct to speak of the mind. So they say their brain. And I I say, okay, you do science with your brain. I happen to believe that the mind and the brain are distinct, but never mind. Tell me about your brain. Uh, How, what's the brief history of the brain? And they say, it's very easy. The brain is the end product of a mindless, unguided process. And I smile at them and I say, and you trust it? Hmm. Tell me honestly, and I've asked many people this, leading scientists, if you knew that your computer was the end product of a mindless, unguided process, would you even use it? And everybody has said no. So I said, you have a problem, don't you? Here you are doing science, and you claim you're doing it with an instrument, your brain, which is the end product of a mindless, unguided process. There's something going wrong somewhere. 
And you see, it seems to me here that there's a detail in Genesis at the beginning that is utterly profound. And that is the repeated statement, and God said, and God said. That is, according to that text, the universe and ourselves included is the result of a sequence of speech acts. And this idea of God as the word is the exact opposite of the atheist view. You see, what my atheist friends tell me is that in the beginning there was either nothing or mass energy, as you just hinted earlier. And mind is derivative at the high end of all that mass and energy managed to permute themselves into. Whereas the biblical revelation puts it the exact opposite way round. In the beginning was the word, that kind of idea. God, the word, and God said. And that's the thing that resonates with me. And I find, uh, speaking as a mathematician, that that's one of the most powerful statements and ideas that runs through the whole of Scripture, the prophet speaking by the word of the Lord, and that, that kind of notion, right. I find is enormously insightful. This is a word-based universe, and we see it in mathematics. And interestingly, we see it in biology. I, I always find it quite ironic that the longest word we've ever discovered is in each of the 10 trillion cells in our body, the DNA code, the genetic code. But I've written about that as well, because I think information is a hugely important concept in contemporary physics, but it also goes back, if we listen seriously to Genesis 1, the very first page of Scripture, we would be very interested in those, and God said, there are very few of them. Mm. This idea of an input of information from outside, a non-closed, an open universe. Whereas my atheist friends, they regard the universe as a closed system of cause and effect. So there's diametrical difference. But the reason I go for the one side is it makes sense. The other just doesn't make sense. It undermines rationality completely. Right. Uh, couldn't one argue on that, though, that um, that the brain does evolve e even mindlessly be, uh, be in the sense there is an evolutionary benefit to uh, understanding the structure of, well, ma let's really? say math, maths. In the sense there's some benefit to being able to build a, a building by doing mathematics. And, <laughs> and since... Ultimately, maths is the science of all extension. It's, it's uh, the underpinning of, of the way anything could possibly be if it's divisible. Therefore, by reflecting on that more and more and more and more, we've been able to develop the mathematics that happens to work in our particular structure of extension. Well, I have heard that explanation. And uh, <laughs> I've also heard many atheists say, the one thing I cannot see, how there's any evolutionary benefit of mathematics and a lot of other things and, and music. But I think, you know, evolution as a word, and this could lead us into hours of discussion, is a bit like the god of the gaps. How did it happen? Evolution did it. But unless we have a mechanism that shows us how these things can uh, arise from simple to complex forms and really show how it happened, I remain totally unconvinced. And I'm actually writing at the moment on the origin of life where very little is known. I think there's a huge amount of hype and speculation, but <laughs> I certainly wouldn't stake my life on the fact that we've got a reasonable explanation in terms of mindless, unguided processes. Absolutely not. We, with our minds, cannot begin to build a cell. And yet we believe that within a few billion years, um, unguided natural processes can produce a cell. The more I study this kind of stuff, the less I believe in that, and the more it points towards there is an intelligence behind it, and it's pretty obvious we can see it. Right, but just to pressure a little bit more, just to understand a little bit more your thinking on this, um, 
uh, for me, any any argument about trying to sort of uh, conclude that the, the creator of the universe based on the state of scientific knowledge is a vulnerable argument. Oh yes, I I, I know what I know exactly that that's behind what you're saying. Sure. Right. It's, that's, and, that's, and as for me, that the kind of deeper, you know, you couldn't have an infinite extension to that. That itself is, you know, that's that's not an argument from lack of knowledge. That's an argument from basic, you know, the mathematical yes, structure. Yes, and, no, and no more is the the argument that I've just given that mm. uh, the doing of science is evidence. I agree that you're as nervous as I am. I suspect of arguments from lack of knowledge. Right. But I think we need to push that a little bit further in this case because an explanation that actually makes sense is infinitely better than an explanation that makes no sense. And all of our experience points towards the fact that, and we use it scientifically, that's the interesting thing, that an archaeologist can determine whether something is simply natural erosion, product of wind, rain, hail, and so on, or is an artifact. We have the capacity to recognize that. And the search for extraterrestrial intelligence is another evidence. Scientists believe that they can recognize the patterns that indicate semantic context, that uh, content, that is linguistic content. Well, then we need to take very seriously not only the fact we can do maths, but also the fact that we are using computer language and linguistic language to describe the genome. It is packed full of information. The only known source that we have of language-like information is mind. There is no other. And so, therefore, I feel this is not an argument from ignorance. It's actually an argument from what fits and makes sense from what doesn't fit. So I, I think there is more to be said about it. Wow. But I, I guess the question, maybe moving on slightly away from the question of the existence of God, because I, I do, I, again, I come across people all the time who, who struggle to find, you know, how can you be intelligent, understand no science and philosophy and, and, and not, not be swept away. So I think it's so important and such a crucial and I think it leads people to self-doubt. In other words, I think people's own head might suggest to them, I do think the universe didn't create itself. I do think there must be a creator. But all these people out there say there isn't so, you know, this kind of... Uh, well, you do say, you say all these people out there, but there's an increasing swell of highly intelligent people. I came across a statistic the other day that really interested me. In the 100 years between 1900 and 2000, 65% of Nobel Prize winners believed in God. I, I find people aren't aware of that kind of thing. There is much more belief in God among the scientific fraternity than many people think. And have you, have you heard about the Luba survey? There was a survey done about 80 years ago. And they, who's who in science in America? And they find that roughly 40% of the respondents not only believed in God, but a personal God who answered prayer. They repeated that 80 years later or 70 years later and found the percentage had moved from 40 to 38. That's all. Whereas most people, when I asked them what was the percentage, they'd say two. Oh, wow. You see, on my shelf up here, I have a memento, a lovely memento of Bar Ilan. And it's a stereoscopic microscope. It's just, it's in plastic. It's not a proper microscope. But it's done in the shape of Aleph and Beit. And the two stereo um, lenses, barrels of the microscope, are the rows of the Torah. And I'm very delighted to have that because it seems to me to really epitomize what has been at the absolute heart and the huge contribution that uh, Jewish people have made to the world is that binding together. If ever there was a, a wonderful symbol of science and religion, it's that uh, microscope. It's just superb. So I think, yes, knocking the new atheist is important. Why? Because the public did, it's waning now, pay them a lot of attention, but some of them have gone so over the top into irrationality 
that they're not um, cutting it anymore. But many, many young people I may, may meet have been influenced by them. And so you need to answer the questions. But you're absolutely right. I think it's important that we who see these things and have got a solid biblical base behind us make a contribution and start to say, look, here's what positively, let's say, Genesis says. What is it saying? What is it telling us about the world? I find Rabbi Jonathan Sachs very illuminating on some of this stuff. I've got three or four of his books sitting just down to my left here. So if that's an answer to your question, I, I say, yes, let's not just be negative. People want to know if we've got a positive message. And of course, in these days where we're ravaged by this pandemic, mm. they want to know if there's any hope that we can offer. Right. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've always been very impressed. I remember when I came across the commentary years ago, speaking about the first mentioning the Garden of Eden, that in Hebrew, the word Eden is actually a word for time. Um, I didn't know that. There I've learned something. <laughs> so like in Ecclesiastes in the fourth chapter, it appears the same word, um, which means it's some kind of garden of time. It's like yes. a radically different experience of reality. And, and the word Adam in Hebrew, Adam, is humanity. Yes. The oneness of humanity that is the state that was and the state that we strive back for. Yes. Um, and that the sin of man ultimately is is fragmentation and self-centeredness. That's right. And the search for I see, especially nowadays, very interesting. You'd have thought something like today's pandemic and, and all the anxiety that it brings up is a you know, classical anger against God thing. But I actually am finding amongst people, it's, it's different. It's having a different effect. I don't know if you're finding this as well. A lot more, there's a lot of introspection. There's a lot of reflection. There's a lot of people open to discussing um, ideas and issues, almost feeling, I don't know if it's a humility or vulnerability or something, um, but a much more open-minded conversation I'm finding and, and, and serious seeking and searching um, than I'd seen in previous years. I'm not sure if that's something that resonates with you. Oh, it does. It resonates completely. And it doesn't surprise me because instances of moral evil and what we rather mistakenly call natural evil, uh, things that happen like the virus and so on, do remind us instantly of our mortality and our vulnerability and the fact that we're not in control and all that kind of thing. Right. Yeah, I'm very conscious of time and really, really appreciative of you giving us this time. I just want to say thank you so, so much. I hope we can be in touch after this as well. well absolutely. I, I enjoyed this enormously, da enormously Daniel. And Fantastic. Thank you very much for reaching out to me. I don't know how you heard of me, but... I even did. quoted you. I don't know if you saw the debate with AC Grady. I'm sure he didn't come across it, but it, about um, a few years ago, but I quoted you in you it. You did? Yeah. <laughs> Is it online? I'd love yeah. to watch that. Yeah, yeah. I'll send you the link. Oh, please do. I, as a Christian, I, I feel a huge affinity with my Jewish friends because I owe them such a lot. And um, one of my great regrets, I'll tell you this, is that when I was in Bari Lan for two or three months, at the end, I was called in and the head of the university said, look, he said, we've enjoyed having you here. Um, he said, it's very unusual to meet someone like you who believes the prophets, you see, which I told them I did. Right. Would you stay for a year and we'll teach you Hebrew and you can do mathematics? And I'd love to have done it, you know, but it wasn't possible, a wife, three children and so on. But Really, I felt that was a wonderful reaching out and offer of friendship. So mm. I have very fond memories of, of those encounters that I made. And I was recently there lecturing in the Technion and Haifa and things like that. So lovely to meet you. You too. And well. all the best. Let's know how it went. Fantastic. Thank you so, so much. Really, thank you.